Um, my name is Joe Hedzima. I'm going to be your guide on our six nights through New Ventures. So before we get too far into it, we ought to figure out why you're here taking the course. Now, a number of you, or I think most of you who signed up on the email list told us a variety of things you wanted to uh, get out of the course, and I'll touch that in a moment. But they're sort of over uh, overarching things. Here are some things that I thought you might want. You don't know anything about entrepreneurship and want to understand what it's about. So traditionally in this course, we have people who have never done anything entrepreneurial and have said, I want to put my toe in the water and see what it's about. Uh, on the other hand, we've got people that have already launched companies and cashed out and are looking to do it again. So it's a big, wide uh, audience. Um, sometimes you see something that sucks and you want to make it better. Uh, how many people here use Dropbox? Okay, so Drew Houston, um, you know the story about how Dropbox got going. Uh, he went home for, uh, I think, Thanksgiving. And coming back on the bus, uh, he didn't have the files he needed uh, to do whatever work he wanted to do. And he said, you know, this just sucks that I can't have any all my files anywhere that I am. And so he decided that he was going to start drop what became Dropbox. So if you see something that sucks and you can make it better, maybe you want to be an entrepreneur. Um, a lot of people have an idea or an invention, and they want to do something with it to sort of change the world. Right? Um, I think that's a big driver for a lot of entrepreneurs. You know, as we'll talk about, you know, the financial parts, you know, how much money do you get to be an entrepreneur? Um, it's really, can I change the world? Um, and speaking of that, some people think entrepreneurship is glamorous and you can make a lot of money. I'm not going to ask you to tell me which of these is what you're doing, but there's so many questions you need to answer uh, if you're thinking about any of this. Like, how do I start? What do I do? Literally, what do I do? What is the problem I'm solving? You know, in Drew Houston's case, he had a problem, which he couldn't get his files, so he thought other people might have that problem. But you have to test that, and Bob later on will talk about, Bob Jones will talk about finding a customer. Um, how does my solution solve that problem? Is it the only way? Is it the best way? How do I figure that out? And actually, who cares? Uh, as Bob will tell you specifically, who cares? Who is a customer, and how do you find these people? Um, so now if I have a, a solution, I think I have a customer, how do I make money? How do I make it sustainable? Uh, this is the, the business or venture model that we're going to be talking about. Um, how long will it take to bring the solution to market? What will it cost? What resources I need? How do I figure all that stuff out? Uh, will I need some sort of entity? You know, to, I'm going to raise money or attract people and... How do I share uh, with both employees and investors the, the rewards that we all get for putting time and effort into the company? Uh, how do I keep people from stealing my ideas? All right, so I've got a great idea. Thank you very much, I'll go do it. How do you prevent that? We'll talk about that. Do I need co-founders? And uh, what is our relationship? And you know, how do we figure that out? We'll be talking about that. Uh, how do I negotiate? You know, as, as an entrepreneur, you're always um, negotiating with people to try to get them to work with you, either uh, to give you money, to, be, to buy stuff from you, to come work for you. You know, how do you work all of that stuff? How do I figure out what I don't know? That's a, that's a real thing. You know, how, how do I know what I don't know? I've, I've been tripped up a few times with that one. Now, what are the potholes out there? Uh, how do I recognize them? How do I avoid them? I can tell you it's, it's okay to make a mistake once, but as they say, if you make it twice, that's not good. The problem in the entrepreneurship world is you may make the same mistake twice, but it comes in different clothing. And I've, there are a couple of times I've been down the path and I go, oh, 
I've done this before, I just didn't realize it. And you don't want to be in that position. There are a lot of pieces here. So why do this? Well, I said it was fame and fortune. There's people that you probably recognize and they've all made a good deal of money. And that seems to be the allure for a lot of people in entrepreneurship. There's a reality though. And the reality is only 10% of startups succeed, 10%. Venture capitalists, when they invest in companies, the best venture capitalists historically, how many companies out of 10 do you think succeed when, they, when VCs have put money into them and all their connections and their, um, their uh, help and assistance? What, what do you think? How many companies out of 10? I hear one, I hear two. The Kleiner Perkins historically had the best returns and they had three out of 10. Now, if you can think about any other place where if you lose seven out of 10 times, you're a hero, where would that be? Baseball, if, you, if you're hitting 300, you're probably getting 100 million a year. I don't know what the rate is, <laughs> but we're not used to failing seven out of 10 times. So it's not unbelievable that 10% succeed. There are reasons for it. Um, I wanna focus on this one in the bottom right. 99% of those who fail, fail because of a lack of planning and execution. It's not because it, that, that's really historically. Now this includes you know, people running sandwich shops and everything else. So you know, perhaps not as all dismal for, for this crowd, uh, and I don't know if you've ever seen the Kaufman Report, which looked at MIT entrepreneurship. At the time, this is a 2009, it's been updated, but I didn't have time to get the updated numbers, but it makes the point. There are about 25,000 active companies founded by MIT alums. By the way, there are about 120,000 uh, living uh, MIT alums, so it's only a small portion of all MIT alums. They employed 3.3 million people their annual worldwide revenues was two, $2 trillion. And if you put them all together as a single company, a country, it would be the 11th largest economy in the world. So historically 10% of ventures fail. We do have a track record here when we succeed of being able to be pretty big, but it's not a given. So why this course? Well, this course is really about, it's not about theory, although I'm gonna talk a little bit about a framework tonight to think about things. It's actually doing. And the people who are presenting have actually done or are actively doing the things they're talking about. Um, it's not that they don't understand theory, but they are on the ground, they've done it. And so that's what we um, think is important. The history of the course was we had students came and said, could you teach uh, something on how to start a company because you're practical? Um, and a long, long story on that, but they ended up putting it in the IAP catalog and said, I dare you, dare you not to show up. And after I first got a little incensed about that, I said, well, I got a customer. I've got somebody who wants what they think I can give them. And I better figure out how to do that. And that was the beginning of the course a number of years ago. Now, the, the um, focus of the course is on planning and executing new ventures. And we call it new ventures because it's not just business. After all, the Sloan School is not the Sloan School of Business. It's a Sloan School of Management. So the things we'll talk about apply to a range of things, including nonprofits and social developmental. Uh, but we'll use the words of business to think about them. Uh, our goal is to help you uh, increase your probability of success. And um, we also hope you catch the disease. Entrepreneurship is a lifetime incurable disease. Now, it's not fatal. It is highly contagious and it's highly transformative. Um, and so we hope you'll, you'll, most of you will get this. Um, and entrepreneurship is a full contact sport. It's not an academic exercise. You have to get out, you have to talk to people, you have to try stuff. And we're gonna try to show you how to do some of that. So what are you gonna get if you invest six evenings in the course? 
Uh, you're going to get new or enhanced skills in areas such as how do you evaluate a venture? Now, this is that, what's the most valuable resource each of you have? Time, right? So you'll find out that when you do a venture, you know, it's not like a month. It could be five years, 10 years. So you want to be able to look at something and assess, you know, do I have a probability of success in this? And the people that are looking to invest in you are going to be looking at things like that. And the people that are going to join you are going to be looking at that. So we want to help you think through, how do I figure out if this thing is going to have impact and be successful? How do you figure out who your customer is? Uh, how do you get the financial resources? We're going to have a panel on financial, financing sources and uh, you know, where you can get those. How do you scale a venture and make it sustainable? So you, know, you can get to a certain point. How do you get to that next point? How do you plan to get there and accelerate? We'll be talking about that. Uh, how do you build a top-notch team, um, especially when you don't have any resources? How do you how do you pull a team together? You know, if you're in the NFL, you can give money and bring people on board, uh, and etc. But you normally don't. Uh, how do you negotiate deals? We're going to have a negotiation a workshop tomorrow uh, around an actual real MIT case. What are the legal pitfalls, and what do I need to know? I'll be talking about that on Thursday. I'll drown you in more information than you can absorb, and but hopefully you'll keep the slides. Uh, how, do you, how do I pitch the idea? And it's not just pitching to investors. Bob Jones, who I'll introduce in a moment, is going to come back and talk about pitching. There are a lot of moving pieces here. And hopefully, during this course, as, as you go through it, you'll, start, you'll ask yourself these questions. And maybe at the end, you'll be able to answer it. Do I really want to do this? Should I do it? Why are you doing it? <laughs> Should I do it now or later? You know, now, you know, when you graduate from MIT, you're used to hard work and usually not a lot of great food and stuff. You're, you know, so it's a good time to launch a business because your expectations in terms of creature comforts are low. Um, is this for you? These are things that are hard to really teach and talk about, but it is a personal decision when you step up to be an entrepreneur. I had that, uh, my first uh, entrepreneurial venture, I was in third grade. Um, I was too young to be a paper boy. You know, newspapers, those are those things that you open up. I don't know, do you have newspapers anymore? And people would deliver them to your door. I was too young to be a, a, a newspaper deliverer. So my mom said, well, if people have newspapers, they'd like to get rid of them. Maybe you could go around and collect the newspapers. So I went around and I collected newspapers. Uh, I got enough, and we would take the newspapers, put them in the car, take them to the scrapyard, and they'd weigh and, and pay me for it. And I was so smart, I said, if I stay in the car at the beginning with the newspapers and they weigh it, and then we take all the newspapers out, I get out of the car, I get a little extra. I weighed probably 50 pounds at the time or something. Anyway, I made enough money to buy a couple of wagons and hire some second graders. Um, and we had a little business going. And then I thought, well, how do I extend this business? And I said, well, I could do a newspaper. So I had somebody gave me one of those newspaper, you know, handheld things. So we started delivering newspapers about the neighborhood. And my parents called that off. I'm wondering whether I was spreading gossip. I, I don't know why. I was probably saying things I shouldn't have. But that was my first experience in ventures. Pretty, pretty harmless. So tonight, um, what are we going to do? I'm going to tell you a little bit about you. I'm going to introduce our teaching team. And then I'm going to do a, a, an overview of new ventures, um, trying to show you some higher level ways of thinking about it that will help you digest the individual sessions that are going to go uh, throughout. And then Bob, and we're going to have a team building uh, break. And then we'll have Bob Jones will come and talk about finding your, your customer. So, um, who are you? We have, uh, we're, we're doing a Zoom broadcast on this. We have 360, I think, people that signed up for the email list. So, 
it's a pretty big group. We have a pretty good group here. You're from a variety of different uh, students from a variety of different uh, schools. How many from Sloan School? Wow, okay. And how many uh, engineering or science? Okay. You know, the first time I did this class where we asked that, it was really interesting. All the Sloan people were on one side and all the engineering and science people on the other. So the first thing we did was we said, if you have an odd number seat on this side, go and sit in an odd number seat there and back and forth. I'm glad to see you're already mingling. So we're already ahead of the game on that. Um, we have a number of non-student participants, alums, uh, staff, others. We have people from a variety of universities, either in person or remote. Some Harvard people, uh, Babson, um, a whole bunch. I had a whole list I was going to read off, but trust me, there were a lot. And you have a wide range of interests. When you sign up for the email list, and you can see on the screen the uh, interests. What we've done, and I'll talk about it more at the break, is because we want to try to foster teams. A uh, number of successful 100K teams have come out of this that have actually gone on to be real businesses. We've put signs around the auditorium. And at the break, if you have an interest in an area, just go stand there and introduce yourself and see what happens. Okay. Now, with such a, and when I looked at what you were looking at, I said earlier, we have somebody that are just putting their toes in the water. And we have people that have done multiple ventures. We have people who are thinking of spinning out of companies with their current jobs. And so there's such a wide range of <clears throat> knowledge and expectations that I had to come up with an equation. And Bob's seen this before. So if you know what this is because you've taken the course before, don't answer. <laughs> H equals R divided by E. The job is to maximize H. I'll give you a hint what H is. Happiness. What are R and E? Oh boy, we're in trouble. <laughs> it's not a quadratic equation. No? Anybody? <laughs> Okay. Well, normally, oh, we have, yes, where? Excuse me? Oh, you went right to it. Are you a Sloan person? Ah, see. What Sloan will tell you is revenue divided by expectations, uh, expenses, excuse me, which is a subset of reality divided by expectation. So this equation is very important for a lot of reasons. If you uh, over-promise and under-deliver, you, you have problems, right? And so you've got to keep this in mind in anything you do. And the way to make you all happy here is if I can have you all reduce your expectations to zero, then you'll be happy, right? Because that you'll be infinitely happy. It's a universal thing. Think about it in your, in your own life. If you under um, uh, um, promise and over deliver, you have a happy person on the other end. Boy, we're going to have to have a remedial math course here, I think. Okay. So who are we? Uh, all of the people speaking here, the only person, I'm sorry, Sam, the only person in this, in this course that's getting paid is Sam and, and his money. I mean, it's hardly anything. I think you can buy us a, a lunch, right? Ice cream. Okay, he's going to treat us all to ice cream. These are highly paid, un, unpaid volunteer speakers. And the question is, why do they do it? Um, You'll find that entrepreneurship can be a lonely experience. And many successful entrepreneurs, I think if you really get them to think about it, they've realized somebody has helped them along the way. You know, they couldn't have done it without some help. And so they, I think there's a great feeling about wanting to give something back. And that's why people come back year after year. And uh, I keep trying to increase their compensation, but they turn it down every time. Um, too much tax things. Uh, we have two teaching assistants, Sam Oppenheimer, Sam. Yeah. He'll be here for the first week and Aaron will be here for the second week. They're very important as you'll find out later. Uh, this is this is me. My, this, uh, I've been involved in launching a lot of uh, things, a lot of new ventures, either as a co-founder, an investor, a board meeting, a member, or, or a mentor. Um, I've 
was a practicing law for a number of years. Uh, I was a founding judge of the 100K competition and global chair of the Enterprise Forum when it was around. And, uh, you know, generally have hung around enough that I have enough bruises that I probably uh, uh, can feel good about telling you what not to do. Uh, Sam, this is a little bit about Sam. Uh, we were talking about what a good picture that was. It was a quick selfie that he had to take to put it in a book, but now it's everywhere. Uh, <laughs> he was co-founder of a B2B marketplace in South Africa. And uh, maybe at some point you can tell us about that. And uh, has a master's in physics from Oxford. And he's the co-managing director of the uh, incoming director for the coming year for the 100K competition. And, you know, at later this week, once we get settled down, he'll tell you a little bit about the schedule of the 100K for those that are interested. And then Aaron, who'll be here next week, uh, has a background in cybersecurity and mechanical engineering. And when he's here, we'll have him talk a bit too. So new ventures overview. Each of the individual sessions are gonna be more in depth around a specific thing, getting down to real practical things. Tonight, what I wanna do at the beginning is to give you some ways of thinking about it. I don't wanna call them frameworks, but these are things that I've learned over the years that help me think about a, a new venture. And uh, we'll come back to some of these as we go along. So practical stuff coming later, this is more of a high level thing. So all you really need to do to be successful as an entrepreneur are two things. It doesn't matter you know, what, what kind of company it is. It doesn't matter whether it's profit or nonprofit. The first thing is you have to create value. If you don't create value, you don't have anything, right? So it has to be, you have to create value. Now there's a lot behind that. What kind of value? For whom? How much value? What does it take to create the value? How do you deliver it? There's a lot of stuff there behind creating value, but at the high level, create value. By the way, these, these slides will be on the, the website, so feel free to take the pictures though. <laughs> The second thing is, if you create value, you've got to harvest some of it or capture it. Because if you don't, you're basically a charity. And that's okay if that's what you want to do. But you if you can capture some of that value, so you can do it again. In the world of for-profit business, you know, that's profit eventually, right? Or cash flow. In sustainable, in, in the nonprofit ventures, it's capturing something so you can do it again. And the question is, from who do you get that? And that's the business or venture model. So those are the only two things. Have I created value? And can I capture some of it? And then when you dig down into it, how much value do I create? How much can I capture? Can I actually make a living on that? Can I assemble a team? There's a lot of moving things underneath, but at the high level. The other, another way of looking at things that I've, this has come to me after looking at thousands of uh, pitch decks and venture plans and talking to investors. I think investors look at three things when they're hearing or looking at uh, an opportunity. And you should be looking at these too, because again, time, you're investing time. The first is, why this? Why is this thing you're thinking about something that you should do? Why is it worth pursuing? Is it the size of the market or a problem worth solving? Amy Smith uh, was in the 100K competition. Amy was at the Edgerton Center here. I think she still is, but went on to win uh, a MacArthur Genius Award, one of those prizes. Amy stood up in front of the 100K and said, uh, this is basically her pitch. 1.9 billion people on the planet do not have access to clean water. That sort of took me by surprise. In order to test for biological contamination of water, you must incubate a sample for 24 hours. The only incubators out there are powered by electricity. The 1.9 billion people without clean water pretty much don't have electricity. I've got an incubator. It doesn't require electricity. Now, the reason that's sort of actually a pretty good pitch, but the point is that was a big 
a big problem. I was totally blown away and had no idea that 1.9 billion, this was you know, 15 years ago, so it's probably, hopefully less now, but probably more. So that's something you might want to spend your time in. You could solve that problem. That, that's a worthy thing. Um, why now? Why is now the right time to do this? Um, sometimes it's a convergence of opportunity and solution. We had an entry in the 100K uh, that was really elegant. It, it had a whole new way to uh, run an air traffic control system. It was real. I mean, it had all the technical stuff. It was really quite good. And the, the problem was, well, you know, look, you can't put a part of an air traffic control system in. You've got to do the whole thing. And, and the, the people said, well, didn't you know that the FAA put out a request for proposal for a new air traffic control system? No, you didn't tell me that. So that's the right time to be thinking about a new air traffic control system. So timing and opportunity. And then why this team? All right, if it's a, it's a good idea, it's something worth doing tonight, this is the right time. Why do I think these people will win? Well, if you had experience, maybe. Although there are cases where second time entrepreneurs don't succeed. There was a company called um, Encore Computer back in the mini computer days. It was founded by the founders of the chief technical person at DEC at uh, Prime and Data General. These were icons. And they got together to start a com uh, company that were gonna make a better computer. So you would think these are, these are the three people that were icons in the industry that have succeeded. The whole thing failed for a whole bunch of other reasons. Prior experience though got them funded. For people that don't have prior experience, it can be a compelling venture model. It can just, you, you've figured something out, somebody believes you can actually deliver on this. And that would include you know, people that would join your team or people that would finance you. I think if you get positive uh, answers to these three questions, the fourth question comes up, why won't this work? This is sort of um, in the sales parlance, you know, once the potential customer starts asking questions, you know, then you sort of got them on the hook. They're, they're trying to figure out, all right, I think this is good. Well, will it do this? Will it do that? Why won't it do this? So think about it when you're presenting. Think about it as you're thinking about ventures. You know, am I pursuing something that's worth pursuing? Is now the right time? Can I put the right team together? And then finally, if I figure those things out, you know, what, what, what are the kind of things that could really screw this up? And I'll tell you, there are things you can figure and screw things up, and then they're always the ones that you can't. But a good framework for that. Now, what I thought I'd do is um, think back of the, some of the ventures I've been in, involved in, and what I learned from those and thought maybe I could help you with things. And I think as I look back, there were four critical components for success. Um, and I'm going to walk through those. And, uh, and then I'm going to give you four examples of something and how of four different companies and how they fit or didn't fit the model. So the first thing is an idea. You have to have an idea, right? And then you've got to be able to execute on the idea. You better get your timing right and you better get the right people. And if you can get all those together, you probably have a success. So let's start and look at each of these. Ideas. Well, you know, ideas, there's an expression, ideas are a dime a dozen. You've heard of that. And that's pretty true. So the question is, what makes an idea valuable? Well, it has to be valuable to someone. And you have to figure out how much value. Again, this is another way we've already talked about. It. I'm giving you a different way to think about it. And what does it cost to produce or deliver that? And how do you capture that? And is it easily copied? So if I have an idea, I think it has, has value. I think I know how I can capture that value and I can protect it. Then I've got the first circle in my four circles. The second is execution. Famous quote, vision without execution is hallucination. 
And you know, Edison, who spent how many times doing experiments and failed? How many times? Now, here are some deals I passed on doing because of what I saw as execution issues. The first is a zip car. Does everyone know what zip car is? Okay. So zip, the zip car people come in and they say to me, um, we've got this idea. You know, you don't have to own a car. You can sort of rent it for an hour or two and pick it up. We're going to, you know, have an app and this sort of stuff. And, um, well, I said, well, where, um, where do I pick the car up from? Oh, they'll be in a parking space. And I said, and, and where are you going to start? And they said, Cambridge. And I, <laughs> I smiled and I said, well, you probably don't know the, the sort of story about when you're trying to recruit faculty members and you say, you know, we can offer you tenure, the Nobel Prize, or parking. And which one gets the first? It's parking. <laughs> Uh, so that ran through my head right away, which probably threw me off Zipcar. But I thought about it. There were so many moving pieces. They had to secure parking spaces. They had to buy the vehicle or lease the vehicles. They had to get permission from the, each city or town. They had to have a way to activate it to, to get paid. There were so many pieces on that. I said, I just, I think the ex this is hard, too hard to execute. Now, they went ahead, and I think they ended up, they did go public at one point, but the founders of that company got very, very small rewards for all the effort. Now, financial rewards. They might feel good that they transformed one portion of transportation, but from a, you know, would I want to spend my time working on that? I wasn't passionate enough to do that and certainly wouldn't want to invest in that. Um, so that was one I passed. The other one was an eBay uh, a precursor. So I'm reading this thing about, you know, about this, you know, place where people are going to exchange things. And I remember thinking, okay, so I'm going to buy something sight unseen from somebody I never met and no one's standing behind the transaction. Is that right? Yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, I, you know, that to me, I don't know how you pull that off. Now it turned out they did, but that was a fundamental point. Now, when you're, when you're looking at things like this and you see there are risks, one way to improve your probability of success to raise money and other things is to say, is there a way I can show that that, can I de-risk it? So if there's something that you could show that this would actually work, that somebody could believe that you had a way to figure it out, then you'll improve it. But I looked at the eBay, eBay precursor and said, no, I don't think that's something that can work. And you know, later on they had insurance and and but there were there was fraud in eBay, surprisingly. Uh, not as much as you'd think. So that's the execution <clears throat> component. Um, now, MIT's motto is men's at manus, mind and hand. So that's sort of like idea and execution. So that's sort of in our sphere here. So my first lesson is ideas plus execution are necessary but not sufficient conditions for success in a venture. Timing is also important. This is a, a, an admission by a person you've met. I have lost more money and time being ahead of the curve. Fortunately, I've been at the right part of the curve from a timing viewpoint that I've actually made a bunch of money doing it but I've crashed and burned a lot of times. And the thing to remember is it can take a long time to be an overnight success. This is particularly true in technology-based businesses. So if you think about it, 3D printing is at least 25 years old. The patents have all expired. We're gonna learn more about that on the last night of the course where Marina Hatsopoulos was a founder, co-founder of one of the first 3D printing companies. And she's gonna if you press her, I'm sure she'll tell you a lot about the history of that. Why is, a couple of years ago, maybe five years ago, I was at an investment conference and somebody came up and said, you know, you're from MIT, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, tell me about this new 3D printing. And I, I explained it's 25 years old. Well, why is it such a big deal now? Because other things had to happen. They had to have better sensors, material science that allowed you to do things. There were a lot of other components that came together that made it actually a viable thing in the marketplace. But the timing 25 years ago 
you know, was not there for big success. Uh, Prodigy, does anyone know Prodigy, ever heard that? Prodigy was a joint venture between CompuServe, which was an online thing, and Sears. And the bet was that people would buy things online. They put about a billion dollars into that, and it failed. Today, we buy stuff from Amazon. They were probably 15 years ahead of the time because the other things that had to have, back then there really weren't browsers, some, you know, you didn't get pretty pictures and things. And there's a lot of stuff, but they were they, a billion dollars, you know, 20, 15, 20 years ago, that was real money. You know, today it's still a, a bunch of money. Uh, fusion. Um, fusion energy is, is 50 plus years in the making. And yet today we think we're maybe, maybe there. People are putting substantial amounts of money into a different kind of fusion. So the timing maybe is right for that. But those are examples of, you know, if you have a technology and it's going to take a lot of pieces to come together for it to be success, and you're an entrepreneur or an investor, you want to think about that. I mean, if you're passionate about it and you have a long view, that's fine. And in fact, that's some of what Gates is doing with their money, you know, funding long-term things. That, and the government's supposed to be doing some of that stuff, but we won't get into government industrial policy. Um, so it does take a long time. The fourth one is the people. And I think this is where this, it's the biggest single source of failure uh, for companies. This is a classic from one day Alice came to a fork in the road and saw a Cheshire cat in a tree. Which road do I take? She asks. Where do you want to go? Was his response. I don't know, Alice answered. Well, what did the cat say? Then it doesn't matter. Why do I put it there? Because uh, teams that don't have a clear vision of where they're going are just like this person coming to the road and not knowing where to go. If we agree that we want to go to go see, I was going to say the Patriots, but you know they didn't do so good. How about we got to go see the Celtics play? And we start to go to the garden and they have a road closure because of construction. If we're adamant about getting to that game, we'll figure a way to get there, we as a team. But if we don't know where we're going, then we stop and we, we get lost. And this happens over and over again in, in, in ventures. Um, in one week I had back when I was practicing law, three teams from MIT came in during the course of a week. And you know, I would sit and it was typically this, I'd ask, you know, well, what are your, what are your goals? And it would run, read something like this. Well, I have this great technology. I want it to become a standard of the world. Okay, what about you? I want to take it public and make a lot of money. Okay, well, maybe. What about you? Um, I, I just want to, you know, I want a lifestyle business. Well, wait a second. Did you three just meet in the elevator? I mean, literally, you're here talking about starting a company. And you, I haven't heard any shared goal. Because the, the person who wants to make it a standard in the industry doesn't care. He, he'd rather give it away to everybody. The one who wants to go public wants to figure out how to make a lot of money. And the other one doesn't want to you know, have all the pressure of being a you know, high growth company. It's not going to work. So figuring out where you're going to go is very important from a people viewpoint. Here are some other people related reasons. Um, this is a, a, a real classic, especially when the market is hot with venture capital money or people willing to fund. You may actually get funded to do something and you may actually put a team together and only to find out you got the wrong team. You put together a football team, but you find out that the, the, the audience wants to watch basketball. And although football players are good athletes, most of them are not going to be good basketball players. So what happens? Now, instead of looking out and serving the market out there, we're pivoting inside. You know, it's all internal. You know, we've got to figure out, are we going to lay people off? What about, what's going to be my job? We've got a, too much headcount. We're burning too much money, you know, and you know, we're not getting sales. And so a classic one is if you're lucky to get funded, uh, but you don't really understand where you're ready to, to launch and scale, 
you'll trip over this. I've seen this happen more times than you guess. And the other thing is not knowing what you don't know. Um, E-Ink was an example of this. Uh, the original Kindle books were black and white. Um, that was the E-Ink technology. It came out of the Media Lab here. And I, you know, we met with the, the founders of that. Uh, and they were so sure they knew exactly what they were doing. And we were saying, well, what about this? What about that? Oh, that's not a problem. Uh, well, what do you think it's going to take? 15 million. And I said, oh, I th it's going to be at least 80 million. I was off by 80 million. They, they raised $160 million by the time it brought, came to market. Now, as you'll find out in the financing things, if you raise that much money um, and you're not making forward progress, your ownership goes down, 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 down and it takes a lot longer. So that was an example of a team that was pretty clear out of the box. I mean, they were really good in the technology, but they didn't really know what they didn't know. And it was very clear to those of us around that, you know, I hope it's a success, but, you know, I can't help you. Um, so another, this is particularly for technology-based companies. And we see it out of the 100K competition a lot. You've got a technical founder and you have a, a, maybe a business founder. And so you, um, and you're talking about, you know, how to form the company and who should get what, what amount of stock. Now, the technical person is probably their idea. They're working to make it work. They may be in the lab, et cetera. The business person, there's nothing really, I mean, they're doing background research and doing market research, but until there's actually a product or something, there's not a lot for them to do. And so when the discussion comes for how much stock they should get, what do, you, what do you think the technical person is thinking? A lot, right? So if we, when I saw this, I put this graph together and I said, well, if where would I put the technical person on this graph early on? Maybe up there. And what about the business person? Now, what happens over time? The relative importance of the technical goes down and the relative importance of the business goes up. Whether they intersect or not doesn't matter. It's just recognizing that each of these components have a relative importance in a different lifestyle or, or cycle of the business. And so if you're thinking about how to build a team and, and figure out how to reward people, you have to understand some of that dynamics to make sure that it works. Does this make sense? This graph, when I finally figured it out, the light bulbs went off on a couple of teams that were having a lot of problems. Now, there's a lot of behind that saying, well, how do I know? And you know, how do we structure it? And those are a lot of important details, but understanding that that's an issue was a key thing. So that's um, the four things. I'm gonna give you four examples um, of companies that I've been involved with, and I'll try to tell you what happened to them on each of these dimensions. So that, that's, the, that's the point we're trying to get. <clears throat> the first one I'll call Speech Co. Um, uh, DARPA, the defense, people know DARPA? I think it was DARPA that did it. Uh, funded uh, research, I think, at four universities in speech recognition and natural language processing. Now, today with AI and everything, there's a whole other component to that. But the idea of speech recognition was what were the actual words that were said? And my accent is different than a Scottish person's accent, which would be different than somebody in the Deep South. So just understanding what the words are. And the second part, well, what did they mean? So if I said, for example, uh, I'm thinking about Chinese tonight. What does that mean? Well, it probably means, you know, if we're going to have dinner, I could be Chinese, it could be Moroccan, it could be French. I'm thinking about Chinese food, right? So understanding that. Uh, so these guys were uh, in one of the labs here at MIT. Um, and uh, it so happened at the time, one of the clients that I had had just sold his company to, I think it was Adobe. And he had a, um, a one-year non-compete. So when you you know, sell your company, the buyer wants to make sure that you stay around, or at least 
he can he or she can keep you there. Maybe you end up, and I could almost in the old days set my my calendar for one year and a day after the non-compete because they'd be back in my office starting a new company or wanting to talk about it. So I put the, the um, business guy and the technical guy together and I was the third person. We were the board of this nascent company for about a year. We had lots of Chinese and other food dinners talking about you know, where, what we could do and where it was going. Um, they um, worked well as a team. They got to know each other. Um, they each had networks of people they could bring in uh, as appropriate. Uh, interesting, I had it just back in my law days, I had another client uh, who was actually one of the companies on here, was brought in as a CEO of a company that was spinning out of Harvard. Harvard. And I had been meeting with the MIT people first, and he came and he said, would you, you know, I want you to be part of the company. And I said, well, I got to tell you, I'm working with these guys out of MIT. Well, you got to make a choice. You know, they were funded out of Harvard. The MIT guys weren't. And I said, well, I got to go with the ones that I've already talked to. I'm thinking, this is kind of stupid because this is a former client of mine that had been successful. And I'm saying, I can't work with you. Well, it turned out that one failed and this one succeeded. They eventually raised a bunch of money. Uh, they went public. And Siri in your uh, phone is basically their technology. So there's an example of a good idea. The timing was right because at the time there was enough compute power. The, way they, the first thing they took it to market with was, or tested it with, was with Eastern Airlines, which you know is no longer around. But they used it for the cruise and the um, um, the attendants on planes, you know, uh, book, they, they are allowed to book around. So they would call into this number and say, I want to be in Cleveland on Tuesday. And they used it to test out their system, not with actual paying customers, but with the staff. And they, they then use that to refine their, their system of identifying word and processing it. So the timing was right. They could do that on computers. Uh, they had good people and they executed. So that was a success. <clears throat> Um, uh, the second one I'll call is Videocom. Um, this was um, digital video editing on a Macintosh computer. At the time, uh, the only video editing was done on, um, you know, million dollar machines. And I think, um, um, well, I'll come back to the, the alternative to that. Uh, the, again, somebody out of the Media Lab and somebody out of Sloan. Um, they worked on it for a good deal of time thinking about, you know, what is the value proposition, who would use it, et cetera. Um, they did not get very far in the 100K competition, but they did set up a company. Um, their original name was Macromedia Business Solutions. Now there was a company called Macromedia that then proceeded uh, to send them a letter saying, you can't use our name. <clears throat> and it, it turned out that in fact, these guys had used it first. And so they funded the company by agreeing to hand over the Macromedia name. And I had a check as a lawyer for them back then. I had a check for $25,000, which was the amount of money that Macromedia was paying in order to get the name. And I'm sitting on it. I, I said, the only thing I have to do, we have to just change the name of the company because we'd already incorporated. I said, anything, call it anything and I'll give you the money, but I can't let the money go. So, um, you know, after this went on for a week, uh, they said, well, why don't you come over and, you know, we've got this, we found some space, come over and, you know, see what we're doing. And I'm in there and they got the whiteboard all covered, covered with different names and stuff. And I'm thinking, these guys can't, we can't even pick a name. You know, how are they going to succeed, right? So eventually, um, well, I'll tell you the name of the company. It was They decided on Digital Video Application Corporation. And let's see if I can spell that for you uh, they, they use this instead of, it's digital video applications. So Diva, all right, good. So we incorporated it, gave them the check, you know. They, they really worked hard. I mean, this, there's a lot of stories about these, including I go over there one time, and there's this big box from FedEx on the floor. They take it off and all this 
you know, fog comes out of it. It was, they were testing ice cream from Ben and Jerry's because they were beta testing Ben and Jerry's ice cream while Ben and Jerry's was testing their, their video editing software. So in two years, they were acquired. Um, now, uh, the company they were acquired by uh, turned out to be the company that had made uh, large video editing systems by the name of Avid. Do you see any pattern? <laughs> they weren't picking a name, they were picking a strategy. They were figuring out what can we do, you know, where could we fit in, who would want to buy us? And then two years later, Avid acquired it. And at the closing, they gave me a t-shirt that said, uh, Diva from home on the front, Avid to Hollywood on the back. And they were, they were hilarious about it. But that, that company succeeded. Now, you know, in two years, they didn't make as much money as the speech company. But again, it was an idea. They were executing well on it. The timing was, was good because the Macintoshes at that point had enough compute power to do this. Although when I tried to see if I could get my local school to take, you know, to, you know, they would donate something. It was, they didn't have enough compute power to do it. But for the right people, and they had the right people. Okay, the third company, I'll call HIV Co. Uh, this was founded by one of the co-inventors of one of the important parts of uh, HIV, um, uh, the mechanism for HIV, um, uh, you know, uh, catching it. Um, it. It was very good, it was breakthrough. That's the first time I met Anthony Fauci. Was, he was on the science advisory board of this company. Um, it was a, a company that could attract a number of good people the science advisory board included Luc Montagnier from Institut Pasteur and David Gallo from uh, uh, in the US, I forget where it was. Those two were in a public dispute over who was the HIV discoverer, enough so that eventually Reagan and Chirac had to you know, meet the president of the France and the US to solve this thing. But on the science advisory board, they were there helping this particular company. Um, they executed well in the science part. The timing was, was great because it was right in the middle of the HIV ep epidemic that was taking off. The people problem was more a founder problem and um, the founder was going in all different directions. And the people that he took money from were actually very high stake Wall Street people. Um, you know, you, you'd know the names if, I, if you knew about Wall Street. And I remember spending all night in Manhattan with a string of limousines parked out on the curb where the Wall Street people were up basically talking to the company saying, if you don't fix this, you're gonna be nuclear. You'll never raise money ever again anywhere on the planet because of the misbehavior of what was going on some of the people on the team. So while the science was good, the execution of the science was good, the timing was right, the people issues literally almost killed the company. It eventually did go public but it never reached its full potential, but it could have easily been. I mean, I just remember standing you know, there at four in the morning and there were like five limos out there with their drivers for these hotshots from Wall Street. So that was an example of three, but not four. And the final one was, I'll call it NanoCo. Um, this is one, one of the early nanotechnology companies. Um, the idea was, was, you know, good, we were, uh, we were mixing diesel fuel and water. Can you do that? We mix diesel fuel and water, uh, which is the first application of this underlying science. We were running it in uh, unmodified diesel engines in new buses at Logan Airport and in old buses in Costa Rica. And we were getting emission profiles cleaner than natural gas. So today when you're out there seeing these compressed natural gas buses, you have to you know, they don't have, they can't go as far. You need the natural gas facilities. These, you could just pour it right into the tank and it worked. Should have, should have worked, right? Well, the timing on that was a little unfortunate. At the time we were ready to go to market, the price of diesel fuel was 50 cents a gallon pre-tax. It's the lowest price it had been in 50 years. 
And at $2 a gallon for diesel, it would have been an economically neutral thing because you couldn't even buy a gallon of water, you know, distilled water at this grocery store for 50 cents. So the timing was horrendous on that part. And there were some severe people issues in the management team that caused it to blow apart. So that company never went anywhere. And every time I get behind a stinking diesel bus, I mean, I spent probably three years of my life in this company uh, saying we, we knew how to solve that problem, uh, but it went nowhere. So those are some examples from my personal experience of you have to, if you can get ideas, execution, timing, and people together, then you can put together a really cheesy animation like this. Had to do it. <laughs> Was that cheesy enough for you? <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Uh, I'm going to talk about two other things and then wrap up. Um, one of the, so what have I done so far? I've, I've Here's some ways of thinking about uh, a new ventures. Uh, and we'll give you the tools to actually answer some of those questions in, in the rest of the course. You know, I started off with, um, the, well, what did I start off first with the create value, capture value is a way of thinking of it. And then the three whys, why this, why now, why this team, why won't that work? And then examples from four companies that I'd been involved with where I think the components of the idea, and we'll, you know, we'll get more into that, the uh, execution, the timing, and the people are key to make it succeed. So all of those are frameworks for you to think about with some examples of it. Uh, you're gonna have to convey that to a variety of people in the course of your entrepreneurial career. So I wanted to just talk a little bit about that. We're gonna have a session on how to make a pitch with Bob. He'll go into more detail, but I couldn't resist putting my triangle away, Bob. So, <laughs> uh, so a mission vision statement, sometimes known as the value proposition. This is something when you're thinking about what you're gonna be doing or you're in the middle of it, can you boil it down to something very simple? In a classic way, there are a number of ways of doing it, but a classic way that Steve Blank out of Stanford uses it is we help X do Y by doing Z, where X is a target audience, um, Y is a goal or saw a problem that they want to solve, and Z is how you do it. So an example that Blank gives is we help people without 3D printers bring their ideas to life by providing 3D printing services and a marketplace for 3D printed products. I mean, that sort of gives you a really quick idea of what they must be doing. And so if you can boil something down, that's not the best example, but it's the only one I had is handy when I put the slide together. Boil it down to those, then people get an idea of what, what are you going to do. When you put that all together, uh, there's a supported vision that I talk about. At the top is the mission statement we just talked about. I couldn't give it up, Bob. <laughs> I had to do it. Um, then there's the elevator pitch. This is when each of these, each of these um, is something that gets somebody to ask you, tell me more. So if I heard your vision statement, I, I might say, well, tell me more about that. The elevator pitch would be the, the thing you would give that would explain that. And it's called an elevator pitch because the theory is you get in an elevator with somebody and they turn to you and say, what do you do? And by the time the elevator gets up, you should be able to explain it. Originally designed for high rise buildings where you know VCs used to work, now VCs are lower rise buildings. So you have to be better, quicker. Uh, behind that might be an executive summary, like a one, you know, a thing. And then if you're lucky, you can do a pitch. So each of these, you know, it's a one sentence for the mission statement. An elevator pitch might be 30 seconds. The executive summary might be two to three, four pages. You know, when someone says, send me something on that. And the pitch deck, the famous Guy Kawasaki, 10, 20, 30, 10 slides, uh, 20 minutes, 30 point font, I think is what he calls it. Now underneath that, you better have a lot of real detail, a lot of stuff you planned on. You don't have to write it all down, but you better know this stuff uh, because the top part is all about sizzle, right? But sizzle without substance, I'd hate to have you end up <laughs> as Elizabeth Holmes where the, you fake it till you make it, right? 
you don't want to be there. And it's a, it's a, an admirable thing she was trying to do. What a mess was made of it. And she's now in prison. So you know, as if you didn't have enough problems with entrepreneurship, we'll come back and talk about this again. The things I'm talking about, think of this as frameworks as you're seeing everybody dig down into the, the practical part of each of these type things. And once again, you have H equals R divided by E. And the problem with, I think, uh, Elizabeth Holmes and maybe Steve Jobs, there's the old reality distortion field where they think they can actually think it and it changes reality. But anyway, we can talk more about that. Final slide, thanks to a friend of mine who's in the audience. Buzz. <laughs> Vinod Kosla invested in a startup that a friend of mine co-founded. He asked uh, for guidance. And Vinod, who was a famous venture capitalist, said, you'll face about a dozen real challenges in developing technology and venture, which is common for most ventures. Five of these, you'll be resourceful enough to find solutions from your background. Am I getting it right, Buzz? Initial five of these, you'll, you and your team will be smart enough to solve. So what about the remaining two challenges? Well, you better get darn lucky was the response. And luck is an important component, but luck favors the well-prepared. And we hope in this course, we'll help you be better prepared for that. So you'll have better luck. So with that, that concludes my overview of new ventures. I hope, hope that was helpful. Um, we're gonna do a, a break uh, now for team building. Um, the, uh, and when I come back, I'll talk about course logistics. If you're in the course and there's a writing requirement, we'd like to have you in teams if possible. But because so many of you said you were interested in things, we took the responses and we put things around the room and for the next 15 minutes, if you just want to go and hang out there, you might find someone who finds a uh, common interest with you and you know, talk, see what happens. We'll come back at about 7.20 and I'll tell you a little bit about the course logistics and we'll turn it over to Bob. So with that, uh, go mingle.